You could tell from their voices, there were about 15 people or so. Their cries were really loud. They would say, oh my head, oh my legs, oh my body, morning. I heard the noise of footsteps and shouts and screaming of about five to six soldiers. They came in and then it started. There was sounds of choking like this. Violent choking, as if someone was strangled. Before he was blindfolded at Danny Boy, Fadil said he saw his friend Hamid al Swadi amongst the prisoners. Hamid had a minor wound to his leg. Two other witnesses have told us they saw Hamid alive on the battlefield. Later at Abu Naji, Fadil, now blindfolded and cuffed, says he managed to speak to his friend. I called out Hamid, are you there? He answered yes. That night the prisoners say they were taken away one by one for interrogation. He said to me, you are a liar. And then I heard him loading his handgun and he fired two rounds towards me. I don't know whether it was above me or to my side. On the face of it, a mock execution. Others, hearing more shots, feared they were listening to their friends being killed. During the night, I had about four or five shots. I could hear them from my cell. I thought they had started executing us. I thought they would execute us one by one. Then there was the sounds of gunshots. Tah, tah, about five or six. Then there was a very loud scream. The sound one makes when in great pain or had something broken or something like that. Hussein Jabari Ali, blindfolded and cuffed, has made a statement that at one point he was held in a room where he could hear the sounds of soldiers and other prisoners. And then a sound started as if someone was being tortured. He was yelling and calling for help, father, brother. I was imagining what they were doing to that human there to make him cry so loud and in such agony. I don't know what they were doing to him. The MOD says the military police interviewed 200 witnesses from both sides and found no evidence of abuse. They say at the time none of the nine made the allegations they're now making. Later that night, Fadil says he tried to speak again to his close friend, Hamid. Hamid, Hamid. Hamid. I waited about half an hour, scared and worried, but then I decided to call out to Hamid. So I started calling, Hamid, Hamid. There was nothing. Hamid, who Iraqi witnesses say survived the battle with a minor leg wound, was amongst those delivered dead the next day. This footage was shot by local cameramen. But were some of the deaths due to what the prisoners had heard during the night, or had all these people died on the battlefield? The evidence is not clear. Hospital scientist Kuda al Swadi is Hamid's uncle. One of the first body bags he opened contained his nephew. Kuda in the blue shirt grieves over Hamid's body. I tried to straighten his neck when I washed him, but it fell down to one side. When I tried again, it fell down to the other side. What does this mean? It means that the neck was broken. It was execution by hanging. He could have been killed in battle, you don't know for certain. I am very certain he wasn't. He believes the mark on his neck was caused by a wire or rope. But Hamid's death certificate also records a gunshot wound to the neck and there's blood on the shroud. It also says that Hamid suffered complete facial mutilation, which seems wrong. When and how he died is neither agreed nor clear. Two days after the battle, Kudar, along with others, buried his nephew. The Iraqis allege eyes were gouged out, some victims shot in the head at close range, and others had suspicious neck injuries. We showed footage, much of it too graphic to broadcast, to a pathologist. He said without full post-mortems, it was impossible to say how and when these men died. So these images are not proof of unlawful killing. In 
It wasn't long before these distressing scenes were exploited by the Mahdi army, but that doesn't mean there aren't serious questions to answer. One of the bodies was that of Haida al-Lami. When the corpse was examined in the hospital, there was an injury which was not expected. Haida's death certificate records his penis was severed. The MOD say their investigations concerning Haider al-Lami and Hamid al-Swadi are ongoing, but there is currently no evidence to support claims of alleged mutilation of bodies at or near Danny Boy or of torture or execution at Camp Abu Naji. The military police concluded these were typical battle injuries made worse by transporting the dead. They're having to stand on the body. They had nowhere else to stand. Their feet were just going through them, through their chests and things like that. Obviously, that, that's where the story comes uh, about, that uh, the blokes are mistreating the dead body. The evidence we've heard is clearly worthy of investigation and fits the pattern from the Bahamusa case. But that was a single death. And we've seen no proof that anyone was killed at Abu Naji, let alone the 20 dead claimed by the lawyers for the Iraqis the worst possible interpretation of a troubling but confusing incident. British soldiers may well have been responsible for the executions of up to 20 Iraqi civilians, the torture of many of these 20 before death, the torture of nine other survivors, and horrific bodily mutilations prior to some of the executions. Questions? So in the absence of post-mortems, how can you tell the difference between battlefield injuries and these allegations of torture? Well, first I'd remind you that neither Martin or I have said that we know what happened. We say that on balance it looks to us from all the angles that our client's um, version is likely to be true. And almost certainly these bodies need to be exhumed and subjected to a proper post-mortem. Whatever the truth of the aftermath of Danny Boy, had the British Army stuck to its old rules on the five techniques, it might find it easier to brush claims like these aside. Britain's most recognizable soldier, speaking generally rather than about this incident, says that the Army's best defense is the law. Look, what are the facts? And if they make an allegation, the allegation gets investigated. Um, people don't always say, as truthfully as they might, such things, uh, as I'm afraid some of the court cases revealed. Um, but I would say that any allegation of ill treatment should be uh, investigated and the due process of law must take place. John Sweeney reporting. The case for an independent judicial inquiry into the allegations is scheduled to be heard in the High Court before the end of July. The MOD says its reopened investigation continues. Next week, what can you do if you're a victim of antisocial behaviour? Love them or hate them, snakes and their remarkable lives next on BBC One. BBC Two follows Iranians considering sex chain surgery. And on BBC Four now, Michael Portillo on the political life and legacy of Margaret Thatcher.